Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the last uh, session. There's going to be three talks, uh, and then uh, we're going to close the conference. Uh, the first speaker is going to be Preslav uh, Nakov, and he's going to talk about detecting fake news before it was even written. Um, and off to, to Preslav. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me well? Um, so, yeah, I have a, quite a provocative title, but let me st first start with a question. Can we win the war on fake news, right? So obviously there are different kinds of efforts that, that need to happen for that. Um, you need to limit their spread. This is the, the social media companies are best positioned for that. There are some things that can happen at the legislation level, certain kind of hate speech is illegal in many countries. You need uh, efforts from journalists and so on and so forth. But probably the best thing that uh, is going to work to run in the work in the long run is education. So, um, and there have been indications from a few months ago that Finland is actually winning the war on fake news, right? And this was everywhere in the media. And uh, so how do you do that? Well, they do this through, through education. They are putting this into their education system, critical developing critical thinking, fact-checking images, fact-checking claims, and so on and so forth manually so that people, um, uh, you know, are aware of, of those techniques. Um, and um, if you look, um, I have here a map of media literacy in Europe, and uh, you can see that uh, Finland is quite comfortably on the top. They have one of the best education systems in general, and um, uh, they, have, they are quite good at media literacy, while some other countries, for example, my home, Bulgaria, is like at 30 percent. UK is at 60, which is not bad, but some other countries are, you know, as low as 10, right? So, and um, there has been a recent study which was um, um, presented by uh, Euro Commissioner Maria Gabriel, who is in charge of uh, fighting disinformation in the European Union level, um, which shows that 75% of young people don't recognize the fake news, which means that there is a lot that you can do at the level of education. And of course, this is not new, right? These ideas are not new. So if you go back to uh, Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda of the Third Reich, somebody who really knew his job well, he says that propaganda becomes ineffective the moment we are aware of it. Okay? So the best way to fight disinformation is through raising awareness. And actually the very fact that we are here talking about fake news, even in the general discourse, is something very, very positive because it's, it's going in the direction of awareness. So in Qatar, in the Qatar Computing Research Institute, we have this Tambi project, which in Arabic means awareness warning um, and uh, the goal is exactly that to raise awareness to educate the population and we have three unique elements in that project so the first is that we are building a news aggregator something like google news right Th think of something like google news i'm going to show it in a bit um, which actually tells you when you're reading something propagandistic or something biased and so on and so forth and it's something that everybody can go and try um, and uh, the second thing that is unique is that we are profiling media, we are building media profiles so that you can go and you can check, you know, the, the, the different biases of media and, and uh, this goes in the direction of fact-checking news before it was even written. And I'm going to elaborate on that. And the third thing is that we are showing to people fine-grained propaganda analysis, kind of specific techniques that are being used. And this is goes again in the direction of, of you know, educating them. So it's a project that, that uh, covers people um, uh, that do language technologies, people doing social computing. We have advisors from Northwestern uh, uh, University. Um, then we have um, a cooperation project that is aligned with that with MIT. Um, we have some people here, even some joint postdocs. Um, and then over the years, we have been working with a number of students from the Sofia University. And uh, we are working on this closely with Al Jazeera, uh, more recently with RTR1 and the Associated Press, and so on and so forth. So here's what, how Tambi looks like. I'm going to open the sites, uh, site at the end. But um, as we read the news, it signals to you that this is likely to be propaganda. And here you see, oh, Netanyahu accused of trying to turn Israel into Iran. And you know, if you kind of click there, you can see that there's some propagandistic content there. The other thing that we do is we are uh, estimating the general uh, factuality of reporting of, of a website and, and uh, its leading political ideology, kind of bias left, center, right. Now, okay, let, let's talk a little bit about bias and factuality of reporting. 
There has been a lot of work in the fact-checking community, both um, in the manual fact-checking, but also automatic, to fact-check claims. So claims is something that has uh, a holder. So for example, here we have, you know, Elon Musk saying something. This specific statement caused him a lot of, pro a lot of troubles with the Securities and Exchange Commission, right? Um, or rumors. Rumors have no clear origin. It's not clear where they come from. Oh, Putin is dead, you know, and somebody else is r running Russia. Or fact-checking articles. So here's an article saying, oh, you know, when Obama was talking to the army, they, you know, he encouraged them to do a coup against Trump, stuff like that, right? Now the question is, can we fact-check every single claim in the world? Probably not, no? And bear in mind that, uh, as, as has been discussed today, earlier today, you can now even generate those, okay? So kind of those, the bad guys are ahead of us. And there are two very good generators. One is the GPT-2, uh, you know, from OpenAI, and the other one is the Grover from the Allen Institute for AI and, you know, Washington University. And you can even go and take a quiz and see whether you can tell them apart, right? Those are really, really good. Here I have generated something. I put here something like the price of oil just, you know, hit uh, $100 per bar, and you can see what was generated. And, of course, time is critical, okay? And there was a, a famous study from last year um, that shows that uh, fake news travel in Twitter six times faster than real news and uh, go much further, and so on and so forth. There was another study that is kind of less famous, but I think it's even more important, that on Twitter, 50% of the lifetime spread of fake news happens in the first 10 minutes. Okay? So the first 10 minutes. I mean, you really, really need to act very, very fast, right? You cannot do manual fact-checking probably in that time, and it's not clear we can do automatic fact-checking in that time, because for many claims, you need to see the reaction of users in social media, as previously has been presented here, or you want to see what mainstream media write about it, but it takes them time to do that, okay? So what can you do? Well, I believe, we believe that the best thing is to go after the source, okay? Um, and so the idea is that even if somebody puts a claim in social media, they typically are going to put a link to, you know, a web page somewhere. Now the thing is they are not going to create a new website, fake news website for every fake news that they are generating. They are going to reuse them. And we can go and you can see which are the most important ones and you can profile them in advance. And then we can be prepared, right? And this way, uh, I like to say that we can fact check the fake news before it was even written. Because the moment when it's written, you put it on a website and you can have a prior idea that tells us whether you can trust this or not. Right? Of course, this is just like a rough uh, approximation, but um, yeah, it's something that can work instantaneously. So how we do that? Well, we are looking into different information sources. We are looking into what the media write, Primarily, this is kind of the most important source. We are looking, well, is there subjectivity? Is there appeal to emotions? Are there moral categories like, uh, you know, war and religion being discussed and so on and so forth? Um, and we are also looking uh, into social media profiles of those media, right? How they self-describe? Is there a link to the original website? And, um, and uh, we are looking into Facebook, we are looking into Twitter, we are also looking into uh, uh, YouTube because we want to see not ex only what is said, but how it is said. Okay? And um, then we look into um, Wikipedia, what is about them, um, uh, some traffic information from Alexa Rank, and we are putting all this together. And um, so here you have for factuality of reporting, a majority class baseline of 46, we go to 80%. Um, and left-center right bias, um, uh, you go to 82% with a baseline of 37%. So the second thing that we do is we work on propaganda, which is a fine-grained uh, propaganda. So we are looking into the use of specific techniques. Basically, we are spotting them in text. We are uh, understanding, kind of trying, trying to find them. Those techniques are of two general kinds. They are either some kind of appeal to emotions, to prejudices, at all, uh, or, or they are some kind of logical fallacies, like you read either with us or against us, stuff like that, right? And we are, uh, so if people see those in text, this kind of explainability is also something that is training them to recognize this in text. We had a hackathon on that, uh, which was quite successful. Um, we have another one coming now in Hong Kong uh, at MNLP, and we have another at SMFL that you can actually uh, see. And we have been also working with, um, 
Al Jazeera, Associated Press, RT, and so on, on, on applying this to the media domain. So, for example, to fact check videos or to detect the bias in videos or to detect graphic content. Here, for example, a truck is going to hit people. Um, we have um, APIs for that. APIs where we can, uh, uh, that everybody can use. I don't think I put the link here, but I can show it in a bit. Um, so we can detect the propaganda at the article level or at the sentence level, this fine-grained propaganda. We, you can detect the bias at the article level, check worthiness in an article to see which sentences are most worthy of fact-checking and actual fact-checking. And this is something that you guys can use. And this is what we used, you know, for, for, for this project, for this Catalyst project. Um, okay. So let me, okay, before I go to the demo, so we are profiling media. So for example, here you see that for Sputnik, for example, you find that it's not very factual. For RT, this is fine-grained analysis uh, with respect to different topics. And you see that they're kind of supporting bad, both, both left and right causes because they're in the business of uh, polarizing the society. Here he says something for Breitbart which is the degree of propaganda, and you see that there's quite, quite a lot of propaganda here. Now I'm going to switch, let's see how it goes, to the actual, okay, I'll show it here. Okay. Here it is, Tambi, right, it's a news aggregator, and as you read the news, right, it signals to you that something is likely to be propaganda. Right, here's one specific article. And then, um, yeah, I can, I can, okay, let me show you some good source, for example, BBC, right? What we know about BBC? Well, we know it's central, it's not hyper-partisan, and then uh, we have analyzed more than 50,000 articles, and we find that 95.8% of them, percent of them are very unlikely to contain propaganda. Um, and then this is the general frame of reporting. So any conflict, let's say Brexit, right, has different aspects, has a political aspect, but also economic, also legal, also human rights, and so on and so forth. Um, and here you see that, uh, yeah, it's not really political, it's primarily cultural identity. Um, this is the general factuality of reporting based on all these information sources that I have told you about. This is the leading political ideology. It's kind of center, a little bit of left bias, and also on a seven-point scale. You can see that, um, and this is kind of the audience. This is the bias of the users, of the Facebook users that are, you know, uh, interacting with that medium. And you see that there is a liberal bias. And this is according to Twitter, you see that on a number of topics there is, there is a left bias. And then we also have, uh, uh, you know, we have the stance with, on, with respect to different claims on different topics. So for example, you see that they strongly disagree with the claim that, fact uh, that climate change is a flat out hoax. Um, Something else that we have, okay. We also have um, profiles for entire, for entire events. Okay, oh, it's doubled. Um, so here, for example, we have Brexit and uh, we have a map where we show who reports on that and where propaganda comes from. And uh, we report the top reporting countries and media in absolute and relative terms and the top propagandistic countries and media in absolute and relative terms. And then you see that this is not a very propagandistic topic. It's 80% clean content and the way that it's discussed is primarily political, by far political, right? And only then cultural identity. Um, if you look at something like, let's say, vaccines, right? Um, you see that there's much more propaganda, okay? It's only 60% clean, and then of course it's not political, it's health and safety, and then cultural identity and quality of life. And uh, if you look at something like, um, let's see, climate change. Yeah, not much propaganda. Oh, we also have the top reporting media um, on the topic, and uh, this is the general reporting, and this is kind of the, re the media that over-reported. Um, and uh, I don't know, let me show you Christchurch mosque shooting, for example, right? It's a very propagandistic topic, and it's not really political, it's cultural identity and, and crime and punishment. Okay, thank you. Any questions to Preslav? Uh, 
Um, Keys to API. Any hands? No? I actually had a question if I can. Um, so you showed that the percentage of propaganda t um, articles in, um, in the case of Brexit, for example. Mm -hmm. So Brexit is very, very heavily reported. So you have a lot of articles about it. So that might mean that you may have propaganda, but it's kind of not visible because you also have a whole lot of just factual reporting that's yep. just reporting on all the news that's happening all the time. So are you looking at the absolute values as well as the percentages? Well, I mean, yeah, we, we are looking into the distribution, right? How it's being discussed. So, um, and, and, uh, but let me, let, me, let me show you, right? There, there are topics that are indeed much, much more propagandistic. So this Ilhan Omar, this is the Muslim uh, politician from the US, right? You see a lot of propaganda here, and it's by far political, and, uh, you know, only then, then it's about cultural identity. Thanks. Any more questions? There is one at the back. The mic is coming. Thanks. So much. Just talk, just easy talk. Okay. Yeah. So, um, one question that I have is I've seen a few of these kind of um, very nice uh, interfaces that, that add you know, claim information and saying how, how much propaganda there is and so forth. Uh, but um, in some sense, uh, you know, when I'm consuming the information, I'm not on a platform like can be, right? So I, I don't know if you've had any um, thoughts uh, about integrating these into the news platforms directly and whether you think there's a difference in the effectiveness of having a separate platform which gives better, um, be better information and more information, richer information, versus having something right in the middle, more immersive, right in the middle of my information consumption experience. So this is a very good point. Um, we don't have that many users of them be as a present, but um, I think that it's still very useful because um, if you interact a little bit with the system, it probably is going to uh, help you understand the critical thinking, kind of, you know, create the critical thinking uh, that is needed for that. And um, um, so we also have this API that other people can use to integrate into a system. So if you want to use it, you are welcome to use it. If you want to use it, uh, you know, heavily, then please talk to us because then we probably need extra servers and all that. But, you know, if it's just like to try it for something simple, you are, you are welcome to use it. So, I mean, anybody can, can, can use that and put it into other applications. Thank you, Preslav, and thanks for the question. Uh, next up is Tom Stafford, cognitive scientist.